Well, good morning. Lovely to see you all. And welcome, as you've already been welcomed by Lois or Lewis or Louise or whatever it is you want to call her. It's great to see you and it's lovely to have you with us online as well. Just need to check something out just before we start, okay? I'm kind of asking this a little bit tongue in cheek, but has anyone got like any heart problems or you're a bit of a nervous disposition or anything? Leon, where's your first day today, aren't you, Leon? We have got one of those defib machines, haven't we? We have, right, we're all covered, that's all right. You'll find out in a bit why I'm asking this. So today's question was, who would or what would you go to a fancy dress party as? So have we got any answers to that in the fancy dress line? Myself? <laughs> Superhero van. Go on, Daniel. A werewolf? Oh, that's impressive. Okay. Any others? A pat who was that? Was that you, Janet? Oh, go on, Michael. Humpty Dumpty. Oh, that's brilliant. I like it. Okay. So normally, like with fancy dress parties, it's usually something like maybe a cowboy or a superhero. And as we've already heard mentioned, like some people go as pirates, don't they, to fancy dress parties. I am. <laughs> you scary lot. What is this place? Hello, lady. Hello, pirate. Would you like to join my pirate crew? No. <laughs> no, honestly, no. No? Well, that's a shame. I'm sure, as this beard is black, this lady's husband came to me last night, offered me ten of these gold coins to take her on a Mediterranean cruise. Oh, oh, nice, nice. <laughs> she said six months, a year, maybe forever. <laughs> Very good. But what about you? Would you sign up for one of these? <laughs> Gold coins? Oh, whoa. Anybody? <laughs> oh. Hey, oh, behind you, Daniel. <laughs> you scurvy lot, who'd be a shipmate? First of all, you get all the treasure your hearts desire. In the second year, you get a double share. That's more. <laughs> Go. The thing is, lady, <laughs> what they don't know is none of them will survive a year, and it all comes back to me. <laughs> Thank it's you. All mine, and you have none of it. Thank you, pirate. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, pirate. Spice the main place. Thank you. That was slightly longer than we agreed. The, the pirate was there kind of bigging up his part, I've got to say. But thanks to my husband, Paul, for um, willing to do that. But, <laughs> but I've got to tell you, it brings back trauma for me. Because uh, probably about 20 years ago, when we were in our first house, and we lived in a terraced house, which has a narrow front, but it stretched back a really long way. So you'd come down the hall, through the uh, lounge, through the dining room, and into the kitchen at the back. And one day, I was, I was at the sink washing up, and we were going to a fancy dress party that weekend. I didn't hear Paul come in through the front door. And he'd got a pirate costume ready for this fancy dress party. And the next thing I knew, he kind of leapt into the kitchen, shouting, aha, aha, like that. With a, with a dagger in his hand, and I, with a full beard on and everything, and I just like froze to the spot. I was, I was just like that scared, I was speechless. Um, sometimes, if you're watching a football match, and sometimes the language of the players is picked up, and the referee, uh, not the referee, the commentator, he says something like, 
we must apologise for the industrial language that you maybe just heard. If you'd have been in that kitchen that day, and if I had actually had any words coming out of my mouth, there would have been industrial language that day. Uh, I was like really shaking, uh, but thank you anyway to Paul. So he's done this to help us out today because we're in a series called Rhythms and we're looking at Jesus' teaching from Matthew 5. Um, and it's talking about the, when he talked to the crowds, he had crowds who were with him and they followed him up to a mountainside and he just sat down and he looked down on all those people and he looked at them and he just saw like they were exhausted from trying to keep rules in life. They were just tired out from all this religious um, uh, rules and obligations that they felt they had to go with. But Jesus offers a different way. And he talked to them that day about the beautiful attitudes, the Beatitudes, we call it. And we've been looking at those over the last few weeks. We've looked over rhythms of life. We've looked at Jesus' teaching on fasting and on prayer. And he shares those things with us because he wants the best for us. We've sung some words today. You're a good, good father. And Remy, as she led us in worship, she talked about God holding us and, and like breathing over us. And he holds us like a child and he just carries us. We are his treasures. We are precious to him. And today, that is, that is my heading. It is um, treasure in heaven. That's what we're going to be looking at. At the end of when Jesus had been talking to the people, he said this this phrase, these verses, and we're going to look at them in the message version today. Um, and they are from Matthew 11. And Jesus said to the people, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love those, that phrase, the unforced rhythms of grace. And that's what Jesus was trying to get over that day as he spoke to people. If you do it this way, life falls into a pattern, a gentle rhythm. Life becomes easier for you. It's not heavy. It's not meant to limit you. It's meant to give you life and bring you life. And that's what he wants for us today. So our verse um, from Matthew, uh, not Matthew 11, Matthew 6 is where we hear about the treasure in heaven. And this is advice that Jesus is giving us about the stuff that is important to us. So he's saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust can destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you treasure, that's where your focus is. That's where your investment goes. And Jesus is asking us to like flip this round and look at things in a different way, to treasure the things that God treasures. And the things that God treasures is us. We are his treasure. We are like that little child that Remy spoke about, that the Father is holding and breathing over. However adult we are, God has us in his arms. On Friday night, we were around at a family, family gathering and um, we met our latest member of the family who is two month old Paddy. And Paddy was born prematurely and he's still like really, really tiny. And he was just like squeaking away a little bit and eventually mum had rocked him off to sleep and she gave him to Paul, who wasn't dressed as a pirate at this time. <laughs> he was just normal Paul. And he settled down on Paul's shoulder there. And for an hour, Paul just like rocked him. And he was fast asleep and he was touching his little feet. 
And he kept glancing down at him and his little warm head and his ears. And he was just like perfect. And there were nine adults in the room. And the minute that Paddy went, or anything like that, all nine eyes were on him. And this is such a beautiful picture of how God is looking at us. He's just enthralled by us. He's just amazed by how we are, how we've formed, how we're growing. Every time we take a breath, he's on it, he's watching it. Our Father in heaven loves us and treasures us so, so much. I think about that, um, the verse from John 3 and verse 16, and it just says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, but will have everlasting life. That's how much God loves us. And we've sung it this morning, haven't we? We've sung about Jesus coming to the cross, Jesus giving his life, that we can have life. That's part of the unforced rhythms of grace, part of God's love. I just want to get over how much he treasures you, how important you are to him. Um, we're going to look, I hope I can get this right, at a, a Japanese word this morning. So this word is going to come up on screen for us. And it's the word kinsugi. Kin meaning gold and sugi meaning repair. In Japan, master craftsmen are able to take broken pieces of bowls and pottery and they're able to put it all back together. Do you know sometimes if we drop something or we break something at home, we're just like, oh, it's discarded, that's going in the bin. But not the case there. It gets fixed back together. So I think we've got a picture of the actual bowl on its own, haven't we? So look at that. It's a bowl that has just fallen onto the floor. It's smashed. It got broken into so many different pieces, but the master craftsman gets hold of the pieces and builds it again, shapes it, and makes it into something that's even more beautiful than the original bowl it was. It's hard to look at something like that because each bowl is unique and each bowl is different. And that's the same for us. We're all unique, we're all different. There's times when our lives have been broken and when God has like lifted us up and he's put us all back together and he's mended us with these golden lines, this, this value that's already in there. It's intricate work. Kintsugi is also known as something else. It's known as the art of precious scars. And as you look back on your life, you might see things which have hurt you, things which have been an issue for you, things that have been a problem, and things and times when you've just been broken and you maybe think you couldn't get any lower or any more broken than you are at that time. And maybe that's even now. But God says, I can mend you. I can put you back together. I can make you even more beautiful than you thought you originally were. I think that God wants us to grasp that we are beautifully flawed. Um, and he wants us to know that the cracks that are in our life, they are just a, a sign of his glorious artwork. I'm just looking for a that's a phrase that I had to write down when I wrote a do because each piece of work, each repair is beautifully unique and it enhances the value of the bowl. Broken objects, they're not something to hide, but something to display with pride. And that's how God sees us. He's put us back together and he's made us like really beautiful. And in all of that, he's just proud of us. He's prizing us. If you ever watch Bargain Hunt, you know that sometimes the contestants find something, a piece of pottery, and they really love it. And then Philip Serrell says, oh, but there's a little chip there. That's going to devalue it. Oh, this has had some restoration work. This is going to devalue it. But that's not the case with God. 
the cracks make us even more valuable because he's mended us. He's built us into something different that's even more precious than what we started out as. When I was like preparing this morning, I kind of felt um, that we needed to do something because sometimes there's a lot of talk, isn't there? Um, and I wanted us just for one minute now just to go quiet and we're just going to look again at that picture of the bowl and I want you to see yourself in that. So I'm just going to go quiet now and I want you to ask God to talk to you in this minute as you look at that bowl and as you see your life. Yeah, Jesus, I just thank you in this moment that the broken isn't discarded, but it's prized by you. God, I thank you that you are in the business of putting all the pieces back together and making us even more beautiful than we first were. God, thank you that we are your treasure and that you gave Jesus for us. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray your spirit is speaking into people's hearts right now and reassuring them and comforting them and letting them know broken pieces are okay. Broken lives can be mended and can be even more gloriously beautiful than they first were. On this journey of preaching today, I kept thinking about um, a verse in Jeremiah 18 and it's along the lines of um, the potter working at the wheel and God wanted to speak to Jeremiah and he, he wanted, he didn't want words for him, he wanted to give him something visual. So he said to Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house that was like there in the village and there I'll give to you my message. So Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and he saw the potter working away at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. And I really love that picture because it's another reinforcement of what the Japanese do with the bowls. It's God, the potter, working, shaping our lives, moulding us. And the times when we think it's just like all collapsed and it's all gone wrong, his hands are on us and he's shaping and he's working. And it's the phrase the way it ends with that it's, um, can we have that verse again? Thank you, because I can't remember the end of it. Shaping it as it seemed best to him. God knows best. God knows our lives. He knows what we need. He knows the areas, the way that we're going. And he's just shaping. Sometimes we kind of go off on our own little tangent, don't we? And we try and, you know, like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And we've not really got that thought for God in there. But he pulls us back and he shapes us and he molds us and he makes us into something that is absolute best. Because what I've kind of learned over 60 odd years is that actually God knows better than I do. Yeah. Like I might have some good ideas, but he has God ideas. And they are just the best. And it's often better to go with what he's suggesting than try and do your own thing for a bit. There's less brokenness that way. <laughs> just a little tip. I wanted to finish this morning with um, probably what is the best TV programme ever. And if you think that I watch a lot of daytime telly, I do on Catch Up at Night. So Homes Under the Hammer. Oh, what a, what a programme. What a programme. They go somewhere, it's ruined, it's run down, and then they go back and visit them like six months later and they see what they've done. 
Well, there was this guy on Homes Under the Hammer and he bought an airfield with an army base underneath it. It was on the coast. Um, and they went back. Initially, nothing had happened. They went back 13 years later and there was some progress. They'd kind of like dug some of the rooms out. They'd made a walkway down. They were hoping to turn it into a visitor's centre. And they said to him, how much have you spent? And he said, 250,000 and 13 years of his life. That's what had been invested so far into getting the project to that point. And they said, why have you invested so much money and time? And he said, hmm, it's my hobby. And I thought, I wouldn't mind 250,000 to invest in my hobby. But the project had like consumed him. His thoughts, his finances were all directed at getting this thing off the ground. And he wasn't a spring chicken either. He probably may not even see the end result of that because there was a lot of work that's to go into it. And in our life, we've got opportunity to invest in things. We've got opportunity to put gold into the lives of other people like we talk about helping our community. Last week in the, um, in the room at the back, we run Make Lunch. And Make Lunch on two days had 70 people on each day who came to be fed, who came for fun, who came just to like make friends, just to be looked after, just to have some community. 70 is a lot of people to care for. And the team, the core team that run Make Lunch are kind of stretched, but they'd love to do more. One way of investing gold into people's lives is to join that team. So perhaps you have free time. Perhaps that's a way that you could say, do you know what, I could maybe help with that in some way. It's not always kind of about investing money. Sometimes it's investing your time. But where you give, your heart follows. And that's what God wants us to do. The things like that he treasures, he wants us to treasure those things too. He wants us to be investing in what is important to him. And he wants us to kind of have like a love, a care, a concern for our community, for our neighbours, for people who are around us so that we're not just like focused on ourselves, but that we realize God treasures these people and he wants us to treasure them as well. Just to close, yeah, I, I came across this, this prayer um, and it was written 500 years ago, but it's just so relevant for what we've looked at today. Um, and I want to read four lines from it. It says, Grant to me, O Lord, to know what is worth knowing, to love what is worth loving, and to value what is precious to you. And that's like my prayer through this today, that we'll treasure what God treasures, that first of all, we'll know we are his treasure. We are the ones that he's put back together. We are so loved by him, so loved. And when we've grasped that, that we'll then want to love others and to treasure them and let them know that there's gold in putting them together and that they can be prized as well. So we're going to sing now. I've forgotten what we're singing, Remy. What we're singing? Oh, we're singing Broken Vessels. And this is just like a prayer from our hearts as we are broken vessels. So would you stand with us, please? And Remy and the band are going to lead us into worship for this. Thanks.